Okay, well, welcome everyone to today's webinar titled Evolving Payments from Making Payments Globally to Virtual Cards. This is Brian from Strategic Treasurer, and we're pleased you could join us as we consider the results and implications of two payment related surveys. Our speakers for today are Mark Pinsarini, Vice President of Partner Management at CorePay, and Anthony DeBellis, Director of US B2B Solutions at MasterCard, and Craig Jeffrey, Founder and Managing Partner of Strategic Treasurer. Welcome, Mark, Anthony, and Craig, and I'll now turn the presentation over to you. Thanks, Brian, and welcome, Anthony and Mark. It's good to uh, present with you on this topic. Good to be here. Thank you so much, Craig. So, uh, yeah, thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, we really appreciate you taking time to cover this uh, key topic. It's, um, you know, we look at how payments are changing over time, and this is a uh, you know, this is really important for people in AP and treasury, even in receivable. So um, thank you for, uh, for joining. Thank you for staying engaged in the chat box as well. Um, this is a, uh, this is fun for us to cover these topics, but let's, let's go over what we're going to cover today. We'll begin with about the surveys. There's two key surveys that uh, our, our partners on the surveys, MasterCard and CorePay um, partnered with. And so we'll uh, share, share some information about that give you an opportunity to download those for free. Then we'll look at investments in payment programs where you'll see some figures, um, massive uh, adoption and uh, additional spend, uh, sometimes approximately 50% are spending investing in payments in any given year. But we'll share some information about how your peers are investing in this space. Um, then we'll look at payment security. We're all familiar with fraud, um, how uh, dangerous that is. Um, and you'll you'll hear not just that over eighty percent of your peers indicate uh, you know plans to uh, address this concern, uh, alleviate the concern, but we'll talk about the different perspectives that companies can have on payment security, driven from both the survey uh, data and information as well as from practical experience from both Mark uh, and Anthony. Then we'll look at the value drivers in payment uh, discussions and decisions as you look at the you know, one side of the equation and the other side of the equation, the, the payer and the payee, um, how, you, how you pay one another, what methods are, are chosen, how that helps with the business process. As we think about that from an end-to-end -end perspective, that gets us to the different value drivers that may be on the payee side or the payer side and coming to some kind of common ground where there's value. That'll be part of the discussion there. Uh, we'll also spend a little bit of time on the payment challenges, uh, payment challenges to adoption and regulation, uh, regulations that happen. So everything from sanction filtering uh, to, um, you know, to fraud, um, you know, the, the uptake and the ability to uh, make payments go across the board, really, really critical items there. And then we'll move from there to our, Key takeaways, uh, we'll have key takeaways about recognizing, uh, recognizing, seeing value and protecting. So some of the themes that you hear us discussing, uh, each of us will give a key takeaway for you to uh, consider as you take some of these ideas back to your organization. But um, but with that, um, we're gonna get you know right into the, the survey. So we have the global payment survey uh, underwritten by CorePay. You can see that on the left side of your screen. Um, and you can also see on the right-hand side, you can see the virtual card solution survey report that, um, that MasterCard and Strategic Treasure partnered on. We're extremely excited about that, uh, both of these. And you'll see um, in the chat box, you'll see links to download those reports uh, uh, pop up shortly. We'll have links at the end as well, but that's where you can click in, uh, download those reports um, you know, to your device use them around your company. But uh, we just wanted to point those out and thank CorePay and MasterCard for partnering on this research. We think it's so important to get current information on key topics uh, across the payment spectrum um, you know, for the industry. So, so with that, um, as we cover that area, we're going to move into our first section. So we're going to be talking about investments that, uh, that are used to create efficiency. So streamlining the payment processing. And Mark, I'm going to ask you to lead us off on some of the areas where we can see some of these 
payment efficiencies come up and I guess some of the problems as well as we look at payment delays. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Craig. Yeah, it's very interesting. I looking at the I mean, we're talking people talk about global, right? I saw Ghana, Nigeria, and just about every every state of the country. So it's pretty exciting when you get to see that that group of people very interested in this. And I do encourage you to to download these surveys. I love the surveys for multiple reasons. One is it in for me, a lot of this validates what I hear from customers and potential customers who are looking at some type of automation, payment solutions, streamlining workflows, whatever it happens to be. The other thing is I, I find there's always no, oh, I didn't think about that or I hadn't really ran across that yet. So I think the survey does a great job of giving giving you as an individual a lot of opportunity to uh, to really do some good uh, research without having to go out and do all the research on your own. You can see it there. I do want to talk a little bit about payment delays. I think one of the things, um, and, and just thinking about this through uh, through my studies this week, I, I didn't realize it, but this month is three years uh, that we had the pandemic. And boy, did that change things, right? So we've seen a lot of shift and changes over that. One of those has been in the way vendors want to be paid. And vendors were, I think, not so much taking control of the payment methods as they are today. Uh, it seemed like the customer themselves uh, probably was controlling that payment method, issues around that payment method, where I think vendors are more involved in that now. AP departments are looking to streamline their workflows. That's That's been a theme uh, for the last couple of years. I've heard it over and over again when I go to conferences and speak and just talk to individuals. They want more automation. Uh, and, and some of that, there's significant issues around payment delays. This is really where it all starts, right? Vendors, their vendor relationships are very important to them. So these payment delays really start to impact them. And there are many reasons for those payment delays. Uh, and here, you know, you see the percentages, nearly all of our pay uh, payments are on time, only about 50%. That means the other 48 basically are, are struggling in some way getting their payments out, whether it's fast growth within your organization and your company, and APs not being able to stay up with that. Uh, document control management is a huge issue within organizations. Human error, there's always human error when, when you're processing invoices and then it's just general cash flow management. So these are making up, I think, a, a, you know, a pretty long list of why these percentages are the way they are today. And it's still interesting to me that they're that high. People wanna talk about AP automation API automation means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And so we'll kind of dig into that throughout the day, but you can see we're still heavily uh, fighting just general payment delays to vendors, which I think is a real struggle for a lot of organizations still today. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, Anthony, um, any comments on that before we move on to uh, the next slide, which is yours? Yeah, I mean, just really quick, I think Mark, summed it up really well, I, I would just say too that even in organizations where delays are the minority, I think what one read that we took from this data was that it can create an outsized amount of friction, right? Um, and, and that causes a lot of pain throughout. And I know we'll talk about that throughout the survey, but you know, really well said, Mark. Thank you. Great. And I'll, I'll jump in here and, and, and talk a little bit about approval processes and, and how that impacts, uh, you know, payers' ability to control when they initiate a payment. Um, what we could see from the data is that out of the respondents from the 2022 virtual card survey, the vast majority, 85% uh, of payers have some flexibility on when they can release a payment, either uh, at terms or early and about 15% do not. And the way we're reading this 15% value is that their AP processes are such that they consume all of the time in the terms, in the, in the amount of payment terms that are available so that once these things are approved, they have to be paid out the door. 
So, you know, just some general thoughts on this is, you know, one, it's, it's really good that most payments are being able to be made on time and even with some payment flexibility uh, of being paid earlier. But tying back to, to Mark's earlier points, it's really critical that we focus on, you know, solutions to, to, to break through some of that complexity and friction in the AP process. Because I think a lot of what comes through in, in you know, uh, the, the the virtual card survey and 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 uh, the global payment survey is that there is just a lot of friction around around these payments. So you know when we look at the, the these numbers, on they are very encouraging. But then also there's some deeper deeper questions to think about: is how early is how how much flexibility and earliness exists today? How can that um, get better and and what friction exists and, and and how can we alleviate that with with new technologies and new solutions and that's something you know at, here at mastercard like a lot of my focus goes into thinking through you know what are some of those those ideas those solutions those things that can be brought to market yeah it's a, it's a binary a transaction if you can only pay as soon as you've approved it there's no there's no flexibility for earlier payments or uh, or, or better forecasts, you know, their information, you limit yourself. And that's a, an element of, uh, of efficiency. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Anthony. And um, yeah, back to you, Mark. Um, so what are some of the top uh, causes of slow invoice approval? Yeah, I thought this was very interesting. If you, uh, when you get the survey, you can see this, but when you look at both sides of this, right, one is what limits of your organization from approving invoices faster. The other is please rate these items based on perception or their impact. The percentages are very interesting. So time to take in to approve invoices and then too many touch points all in that 60% range, right? This goes back to um, where I think we saw on our side, and again, we're, we're more on the payment side, right? But it, when you start to get in with the AP team and talk about a lot of this, 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 is a, this is the beginning of the flow, right? The very front end of this. And what we see, what we saw through the pandemic is a lot of these manual processes just got really magnified because now they weren't able to sit in the same office. So I'm, I guess I'm still surprised that these numbers are still this high, even though we're, you know, we're three years out or we're three years from the beginning of that and at least a year out. And then, you know, time to properly route invoices, no enfor enforcement of timeframes. I mean, they're all just kind of flow together here, which just shows that there's some, some real key issues around routing, around document tracking, exception handling, multiple staff involvement. These all are just what I call operational efficiencies that take away time from multiple individuals to be able to, to really be strategic in their thinking and, and where the areas where they're spending their time. But the thing that just drew me was how closely these percentages were kind of, uh, were kind of tied together. The third one there, workflow management functionality. This goes back to, again, the theme that I, I've been hearing a lot is streamlining workflow really putting processes in place that eliminate the manual processes that allow an invoice from procure all the way to pay, right? That let it flow through and, and have a lot of these manual processes taken out of the flow. It's, a, it's an it's ideal, but I think the other thing that I hear a lot of is people really need to take the time to understand what is their workflow today and where are the pain points, right? We see a lot of the pain points right here. I think these are great pain points. They're going to be different for you as a, you know, as an organization. But I think again, the survey will help you if you're in that, you know, if you're kind of in that mode of trying to figure out where do I, where do I buy my, where do I buy my time back? These are good, these are good areas for you to start to focus on to just kind of understand where are my key pain points? What do I want to attack first? in order to streamline that workflow. Yeah, you know, when you think about some of the things that you just mentioned, Mark, there's the, um, you know, too many touch points, manual interactions. And I think, you know, Anthony's going to talk about manual interactions, but every every time there's a manual interaction, it's slow, it's inefficient, it creates defects that have to be repaired. So um, yeah, great, great setup. And go ahead, Anthony. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Um, so on that point of manual interactions, 
what was really interesting uh, to us when we were looking through this data is that so much of it is really just a lack of remittance data. And, you know, in 2022, 2023, it's still a, a little surprising to me that these are still such meaningful issues. And, you know, I'll draw your attention to, to the stat at the bottom of the screen um, where that 6% uh, or a majority indicate that 6% of their invoices require some sort of interaction. So just to bring that to life a little bit, uh, supplier receives a payment, um, has no idea what it's for, and has to call their customer and, and, and get those details. And that's a, a manual back and forth. 6% might not sound like a big number, but in context of if you're an organization, mid-sized, large organization that processes tens, hundreds, millions of invoices, tens of thousands, millions of invoices a year, 6% is a meaningful, meaningful work, workload. And that's why, you know, thinking about what solutions in the market are available to provide better remittance is just so critical because a lot of these things, they all tie together. And I'll tell you what I mean by that is uh, Mark spoke to on the, uh, uh, on the speed to pay issue. If you address that in a vacuum, you still have this issue on the supplier remittance side. And that's where I think a lot of a lot of the focus in the industry and conversations have been around how do we bridge these solutions that are AR focused and AP focused and come up with, with really end-to-end -end solutions that address these, these types of challenges in totality. Yeah, excellent. So this brings us to our first poll question, but let me give you some instructions before people start typing in the chat box. Um, if you would like to see the poll results, and that'll be shared with everybody, if we had a particular number, the keyword to type in the chat box is VCARD. V-C-A-R-D is the word. We'll still count poll, but VCARD is the word. And if we get 100 and let's just say 150, that's a small percentage of those who have uh, uh, who are attending, type it in. Let me give you instructions for the poll. Uh, the poll should be showing on your screen. It might be behind it. Um, what you can see is uh, the question, in which areas are you investing heavily to improve payments in 2023? This is a select all that apply or multiple choice. You can pick any of those at the top, efficiency, reduction of defects, two types of security questions, working capital equity improvements, counterparty support, let's say supporting a, a vendor or supplier, um, other uh, or none of the above. If you select none of the above, please don't pick the other ones that would kind of defeat the purpose of that, but it's a it's a poll question. It's not a survey that forces that. So please go ahead and answer those. When you're done, hit the submit button, and then we'll share that uh, with everyone once that's done. Um, and if you can, when you're typing vCard, do it in the chat. People are putting the Q&A and, and individual messages. But either way, Brian has to figure out how to capture all these and um, and and keep the count up. So I think we said, what did I say? 150? Yeah. Yeah, that's easy. So we should probably be there. And people are really learning by typing a uh, card. Thanks, Brian, for doing that. We have a little fun with this. So um, on the on the investment side, I'm going to ask uh, Anthony first to respond when the poll questions come up, and then Mark, so you guys can be prepared as soon as we can see what they are. Um, Brian's tracking to make sure how many are responding. All right. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Let's start us off. What What do you notice about this? Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm not surprised. So what I'm seeing first and foremost is that you know efficiency and cost reduction it, it, it seems to be the prevalent response across uh, the majority, followed by security. And uh, security, something we'll talk about later in this presentation. But you know, from other research, from the research we've all done together, um, from conversations in the industry, this 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 seems you know right right on key with with what I've heard. On the cost reduction piece, I think this also ties back, and we'll talk a little bit more in the next slide, but it ties back to all the things that Mark and I have been talking about with invoice approval issues, routing issues, remittance issues. So it's really good to see all this this data tying together. Okay, yeah. Mark. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, the, the numbers, uh, I think, kind of do fall in line with what we're seeing in the survey. And, and again, the discussions that I'm fortunate to have with customers and potential customers on a daily basis. So 
you know, reduction of defects, I think is, is again, this comes back to, you know, finding those ways where we can streamline that workflow, reduce the manual amount of steps and the manual entries, the human error part of it, right? So all of that comes into play there. Security, uh, security has been a theme uh, I know for us and for a lot of our customers over the last three years, really heavily because of all of the, all of the fraud and all the uh, attempts that are made uh, to steal your money and to uh, you know to take take things that don't belong to them. So the the numbers uh, are are right in line with what I what I would have expected. Great, thank you, and um, we'll continue our discussion on spending and investing, and uh, yeah, let's. Uh, uh, Anthony, why don't you um, cover this one? Yeah, sure. Th thanks, Craig. Um, so, you know, as we just saw in the data, it seems that a lot of the survey responses and all the folks that are uh, kind enough to join today's webinar have a similar view that, you know, reducing processing costs, simplifying process is a really important investment uh, to be making in the coming year. I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of good reasons for that. I mean, there's obviously the uh, the foundational frictions that we've been talking about, but there's also um, some market events that are at play, right? We have, uh, especially in the U.S., uh, an environment of inflation, of, of rising interest rates, uh, uh, economic uncertainty um, over the next, you know, 12 to 18 month horizon. And I think all of that leads into a focus on, you know, how do we, how do organizations really control their costs better and, you know, as we've seen through all the data, there just seems like there's so many opportunities to, to streamline and, and really help reduce friction in the AP and AR space. I agree, Anthony. I think the other thing is a lot of technology has really risen to help yes. with those processes. So um, I, there's no lack of, of opportunity to find a solution out there from a technology perspective, I think that uh, are very good today. And uh, again, allows you to get into this space without having to buy a lot of equipment, a lot of it's cloud-based. Those are all things I think today that uh, are available that just really weren't available even five years ago, like they are now. Yeah. And, and Mark, if I could just ask, I mean, do you think what do you think the big roadblock is for for folks? Do you think it's it's education? Do you, or, or what, what what do you think hold, is holding organizations back? Yeah, you, you know, I get asked this a lot. Even when it comes to the payments, you know, what's who's your biggest competitor? Well, quite honestly, the biggest competitor is status quo. It's a you know, it's a big lift to get uh, organizations to adjust. I think to some of the new technology. The other side of it is because there is so much new technology. It, it takes a while to kind of figure out and get your feet underneath you. What, again, what are my pain points? What do I really need to solve for? Because you can overbuy and you don't really need to, right? You really need to understand your business, your workflows. And, and again, what are those pain points that I'm trying to solve for so I can buy what I need? I, I buy a little extra because I know things are changing, but it, I think people get stuck. And uh, so they just kind of fall back to the status quo because it's like, man, there's just too much for me to analyze right here. Thank you. Well said. Well said. So, uh, so Mark, we'll we'll bring it right back to you. So, if they're if they're looking to make these adjustments, where where are they planning to spend the money, and, and what does that mean? Yeah. So we, you know, it, the first one there, AP Automation Technology, it, it's an interesting phrase. First of all, because AP automation, I think, can mean a lot of things different, you know, differently to different people, whether it's the procure, uh, you know, process, invoice, automation, whether you're using AI or not, all the way through getting those approvals and getting it into your ERP system, or whether it's the back end of that, which is the payments process and just automating, you know, the, the, the way the payments are flowing out the door and the, the choices you have there, or is it the whole thing? So, you know, rather than me define that, I think it's something that that each each organization has to define for themselves. So I, I'd love to know what's behind that when they say AP technology. But what I what I look at and what I hear when I talk to people about AP automation is rather than 
defining it, whether it's procure to pay or whether it's some aspect of that in there, it's why am I doing this? You know, well, you're empowering the business and especially AP by reducing your manual tasks, right? You're trying to reduce that. You're trying to, again, free up cash flow, have better uh, eyes on your cash, right? Faster approval process. Faster approval process doesn't necessarily mean faster pay, but it means faster approval process so I can manage my investment better, that I can manage my time better, and it's more fully automated, greater visibility into the data. All of that, I think, and more control in your financial process, all of that, I think, are aspects of that AP technology, and I think that's why it continues to be risen to the top. Bank portals, payment services, again, I think cash management, treasury management, those are all aspects of, of what people are looking to get a better handle on as organizations are growing, I think, at a faster pace. And um, we're just seeing a lot of these, uh, these type of areas, uh, you know, looked at, I think, more closely and invested in. I think the other thing is that Treasury and AP are probably more tied together today than I've ever seen in my lifetime, which is not that long, but still, it's been a lot of that. And then, the, you know, ER, ER payment modules. Well, what does that mean? Well, Again, whether you're doing this internally on your own or whether you're doing it through, again, some type of AP technology or payment technology, <laughs> that's what you're looking for is, is what am I, what, you know, how can I tie this into my ERP system seamlessly, securely, and still get the benefit of making multiple payment methods? I'm not stuck just writing a check or I'm not stuck just sending a notch a file to the bank. Those... Those you can do takes IT time, but again, I think these are areas where where organizations are really looking to gain efficiencies with the right investment. APIs, if you don't know what an API is, um, an API really is a set of code that allows data to flow, I like to say through a pipe, right? It's a secure way for me to pass data from, in this case, let's use ERP, right? You've got an ERP system, you go in, you make your, you you choose your vendors that you're going to pay today. You push the button, and instead of that pushing that button and those payment uh, that payment run going to a check printer, those that data is pushed through these APIs to a payment technology solution on the other side that allows you then to not have to write those checks and the, and somebody else is going to make the payments on your behalf and give you the benefit of virtual card and ACH and faster pay, as well as check and all of that. But it's a, seer, it's a secure pay, pipe, basically, or a secure way for you to take data from one system and move it into another. So they're called APIs. And then again, the last one, TMS payment systems. Um, I think all of this just continues to free up staff to do more strategic work, right? It allows you to utilize your team, whether it's the tre treasury management payment modules or whether it's your AP staff using the ERP payment modules, it just allows your team to free up to be able to do better management, more strategic work, hopefully greater vendor relationships, all of that ties together. And that's where you're gonna get your biggest bang for your buck and probably not have to add staff, which I think is another thing as we continue to grow our organizations in this, in this time, which the economy, you know, is, is still growing. And uh, I think they saw the numbers the other day it was like 2.8%. So, you, you know, organizations are still growing, but you've got to look at that and how, do, where am I investing? Am I investing in technology or do I have to add another person to do this job? So, so Mark or Anthony, you know, as, as, as you were describing this, Mark, it's clearly a, a focus on efficiency, but if you look at the ERP and TMS and the use of APIs, these are all uh, built to streamline through other systems. Is this a, is this a indicator that, you know, embedded treasury embedded payments is going to be a key focus uh, or is it really just efficiency and, and, and nothing else? How would you, how would you answer that? If I could jump in. I mean, I think, I think both are true in my, my opinion. I think the efficiency is the what and then the embedded or cloud solutions is really just the how. And I think what this data says to me and, and you know, a lot of focus I have on is this embedded treasury cloud-based solution stuff is, is here um, 
it's working, it's growing, uh, and it's and it's it's resonating. And that's what this, that's what I see in this data is that it's really resonating. And I think for all the reasons Mark said, you know, how do you uh, deploy these types of technologies without adding headcount to support development and servers and all of these types of things? And this has really just been such a neat solve for the industry to to just leverage these fantastic technologies to bring efficiencies in a really streamlined way. Yeah, I agree. I, I think, and I think it is both. I think, um, you know, we 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 are continuing to look at other payment methods, which obviously makes sense, right? I mean, and, and I, you know, the other part of this whole discussion today is global. Well we're more global than we've ever been. I think we've added more customers making global payments probably in the last 18 months than, than in the whole three years that I've been here, just because of, again, the ability to utilize these solutions, which as Anthony said, are cloud-based. I mean, it gives you the ability to plug this in or tie this into your current system without having to make major changes to what you're doing on the front end, but uh, it allows you, or maybe it does because you're using some of that on the front end, but they tie in. So you have the ability to just be more efficient. And again, I think a lot of this comes back to cash flow is king. You know, having better data, having more, uh, or, or having earlier eyes on the data allows treasury to manage the funds better. And, and to look at this even in a more long-term and strategic way than I think they've been able to before. One one last question for you, Mark. You you, know, you mentioned the last year and a half versus the the prior year and a half, more more global adoption. What would you say the the change has been? Is it like one and a quarter, one and a half times? I'd say it's at least one and a half times. Okay. Yeah. That that's really interesting. Yeah. All right, um, so that brings us to the section on value. I'm sorry, the importance of <laughs> payment security. We talked about um, we talked about how uh, people are trying to steal your money or steal your data and information. Payment security comes up as really important across the board. And so, Anthony, we'll start start with you on uh, payment security. Yeah, sure, Craig. Thank you. Um, so, I think your know, first headline is that you know, ensuring payment security and, and, and or I should say not having payment security remains a really costly and, and material issue for, for organizations. And that comes across with the focus, right? I mean, we see, you know, 82% uh, of respondents are saying that importance of payment security um, has increased. And a lot of it, I think, is driven by, you know, the, the trend in digitalization we've seen over the past few years, that was certainly accelerated by 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 COVID 19s pandemic. Um, it forced it forced a lot of organizations to adopt digital payment methods, and it accelerated others' existing plans. Um, and then when you look across payment modalities, there's there, there's different uh, I guess there's different instances of risk in each payment modality. So there's some so there's some interesting things to think about. When you're when you're assessing payment security, you know when we think about uh, payment fraud during the COVID nineteen era, right? Over the past three years, we've seen pretty significant increases in in check fraud, in ACH fraud, but across virtual cards, it's been about a single like a two to three percent increase depending on the survey. So single digit increases opposed to 30 to 50% increases in other payment modalities. So there are some tangible ways to address this with technology, with payment methods, and with all types of controls and investments. Anthony, you know, Anthony we, oh, sorry, Craig, I was going to say, we, I, I jumped in ahead of you, I'm sorry. We, we talk about this a lot because, um, you know, I, virtual card, I say this all the time, virtual card is the most secure, fastest way to pay a vendor. It's, it's the less, less likely frauded, attempted way to, for money to get stolen. And I think it's an important thing. You know, we, we as an organization uh, made a decision uh, 26 years ago to partner with MasterCard and become the largest B2B 
um, uh, MasterCard issuer in the country. And I think this is a big reason why. It's, it's the level of security that our customers and our vendors have. And you could just, again, it's validated because of the single digit, digit on that, where other payment methods just continually are getting hit through, through all the fraud attempts. Yeah, thanks, Mark. You know, and, and just one other comment on this. Uh, the, the top line, you can see that it's uh, 81% either. It's very important, extremely important to ensure that we have a highly secure payment process. Now, I'm going to point us back, see if you remember, um, you know, we, we assess our, you know, payment processes. We assess the security of our payment processes. I believe that number was 18%, if I remember correctly. So like 18% say that's what we do. And yet 81% say it's really important. <laughs> so that's a, that's going to be a, a takeaway. I'll give that one takeaway. You, you probably want to have all your payment processes reviewed from beginning to end to see where the weaknesses are. And that's the, that's the, Hey, we're recognizing the need. It's really important, but we're not doing something fundamental there. Um, yeah. With that, that brings us to our second poll question that should show up. Um, and again, I think we have, well, now we, we're down to only we have 125 responses. Uh, we need 25 more. You yeah. type the word V card in the chat box. Um, after you complete it, that would be great. And you can follow Mark, Anthony, or myself. You can follow me on LinkedIn or, or connect, and we'll go ahead and uh, connect with you on LinkedIn. We'd love to continue the dialogue there. Question is about concerns about payment fraud. My concerns about payment fraud in 2023, it will decrease from the levels we saw last year in 2022, stay approximately the same, increase from the level we saw in, or I don't know. Um, those are the those are the options. So go ahead and answer those quickly. And we have enough responses. People type V card in. Some people type Poland V card. I'm loving that. <laughs> so uh, thanks for staying engaged. That's fun for us to see people want to hear and want to see the results of the, the polls. Um, you know, besides just on this particular uh, webinar to be able to capture that information. So we'll insert it into the slides. And, um, you know, Brian, you can go ahead and, uh, you know, type in the uh, uh, the connection on LinkedIn thing so people can, uh, can connect to uh, any of us. All right, so I'm going to go Anthony and Mark this time. Uh, yeah, sure. More fraud. Yeah, so I mean, it really, you know, short and sweet, it's a continuation of what we've seen is that, you know, 86% is either keeping this heightened awareness uh, or or increasing the level of, of concern about fraud, uh, payment fraud. Doesn't it, right. I, it doesn't surprise me. I mean, it, it, it just, it's in line with, uh, with honestly what we deal with on a daily basis. So um, I, I, I it can, I'm in complete agreement with what I'm seeing on the screen. I would love to be able to ask follow-up questions about the decrease in the levels of fraud. Is it because more people <laughs> return to work? What's the situation? Uh, but we, we can't do that here. So we're going to continue on and move to um, Mark, uh, payment challenges and concerns. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, the primary challenge there, security fraud management, you can see um, for small and large businesses is, is really high. Uh, and same thing on the increase of likelihood of fraud. So, you know, our business is in the payment business, right? That's what we do and have done for the last, uh, at least for me and in, in, in what I call the full AP payment automation solution, 14 years. And I think what we've seen is the number of fraud attempts to not think what I've seen is the number of fraud attempts has just continued to grow daily over what it was even two and three years ago. Again, I think it got magnified. I think it catapulted through COVID, through the pandemic. I think the fraudsters saw uh, an opening there and took it uh, because teams were dispersed. People were dispersed. They weren't working in the same office. They didn't have the ability to have that quick conversation and things were slipping through. So those concerns, again, have not uh, dissipated or gone away. I think they've just continued to, to grow. Um, and, and, you know, it doesn't surprise me the likelihood of fraud for smaller 
firms, the amount of expense and time that it takes to manage uh, those fraud attempts and to figure out how to continue to combat them is very costly. So if you're a small organization with, and, and we, all, we all struggle with this. I mean, we struggle with it even at our sites, right? Getting IT's, get, getting IT's time to do anything is very difficult because they're very busy and they're usually a pretty small team. But uh, you know, the amount of IT time and staff involved in to continue to fight these attempts just continues to grow. So it does not surprise me as high as these numbers are. I would have hoped that these numbers would have started to come down, but this is a real area, I think that wherever you are in your journey of looking for AP automation or whatever it happens to be, I, I think these are areas that if I was consulting you to not focus, how do I fix this internally, but how do I find the right solution from somebody who's doing this as this is their real, uh, this is their job. Because there is so much going on in this area today that it's very difficult uh, for an organization that's just not involved in fraud to, to try and take this on on your own. And, and again, there's a lot of technology and there's a lot of technology companies out there that I think can, can augment what you have to do internally to support this. Yeah, excellent. So as we move, as we move to um, this slide about robust spending expected about combat, combating fraud, I just want to give a heads up to Mark and Anthony. There's, there's about three questions or comments in the Q&A and in the chat box about fraud. I want to give you an opportunity to respond to any of those that you can. Um, I'm just going to give a quick summary here before we uh, cover uh, any of those responses. You know, this idea of how much, um, you know, what's the importance of these different options for, uh, you know, handling your connectivity to make sure that there's a a good method of of controlling the flow. Each of these is is pretty significant, very important, important. You can see all of the ones on the screen from 67 to 77%, which is in the dark red. Um, the top one, increased control over payment workflows to reduce fraud. And that's going to tie back into uh, the top item. 18% said, yeah, we don't assess our payment security. Uh, was over 80% said this is like really important. <laughs> and so this comes back again, it's like, we all know what the issue is. We need to evaluate our payment security workflows um, and have the control end to end, not exposing uh, points and elements to it. Um, and I want to say that just for some some quick responses. This next sec when we get to the next section, gentlemen, when I, I'm asking too many side questions, so we'll have to go a little bit faster <laughs> in the next section. But handling any of those questions, who would like to uh, address any of those? I, well, I can take the first one. There will there be a shift to B two B e commerce where cards or RTP play a bigger part? And will this change the dynamics of accounts payable? Uh, so I think the answer, the short answer is yes. Um, and, and we see this, I get asked this all the time, you know, are people still, are vendors still taking card? Why are they taking card? Well, I think for a lot of vendors today, that's just part of their business, right? It's part of their business model. It's built into their pricing. It's built into everything they do. And again, they cash flow is king for them. So if I can get them their money faster in a more secure way, and, and I can help the customer do that with less risk of losing that money, it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna be a big win. So I, we continue to see cards grow. I think the same thing's gonna happen with real-time payments. Um, it's a different model, right? I mean, we're talking instantly moving money from one bank account into another bank account and, and that money settling. So there's, there's different dynamics to it, but, but they're all, whether it's faster payments, whether it's RTP, whether it's card, they're all about securely and uh, eliminating the fraud and moving the funds as quickly as possible to the vendor. Uh, so they've got their money and continue to grow their business. Sure. Anthony. Yeah, I'll take the second one. Um, you know, with, with virtual cards and the question is, you know, how does security of virtual cards compare to that of, you know, uh, real-time payment methods like a fed wire or rather an ACH payment. I think, you know, the short answer is, is that, with virtual cards, you can embed controls into the payments. Um, you can designate uh, a card to be, uh, you know, for a specific location, for a specific amount, for a specific for a specific time period, uh, to be used for a single use or a, what we'll call a multi-swipe card, where it can be 
uh, swiped multiple times. And that you can put and customize a lot of these parameters into the payment, which allow you to limit the ability for a bad actor to get a hold of them and also control the destination of that payment and when that destination payee can actually use those funds. All right, great. And we're gonna have to push on. I know there's a number of other comments <laughs> about V cards. So we're gonna have to we're gonna have to make sure we do a, a session on on V cards uh, alone. Uh, but that brings us to the next section, value as a driver in payment decisions. And Anthony, I'll turn it back to you to cover challenges or emphasis on speed rather. Sure, sure. And I'll try, I'll try and make up some time too. Um, look, I think with promoting virtual cards. Um, what we see at MasterCard with our with our customer relationships and the folks we talk to and and data we read and come across is that you know speed is really a key message that resonates um, with, with with suppliers from an acceptance perspective. And you know, I see Mark nodding his head, and this is he's in this business day in day out in, in, in such a large way. Um, but coupled with that, there's a couple other things that are really important. Uh, efficiency and visibility, namely, because it's one, and I just want to go back and just say that speed is important and the end-to-end -end view is more important and critical because just because you can pay fast, you still have to pay um, without adding a lot of resources to your AP team and providing your suppliers you know, some sort of visibility when they'll be paid and what they're being paid for. Otherwise, you have those defect issues. So these things all come together uh, but, you know, for now, speed is just such a critical part of giving supply, showing suppliers there's value in accepting the card network and that value can be distributed around. All right, excellent. Uh, that brings us to our final double poll question. So if somehow you couldn't see on the screen, you answer these two, you get credit for two. Uh, virtual cards, um, the top one is multiple choice and the bottom one is single choice. We... And it just shows how many people have a virtual card program or tried it, aren't using it. And then finally, we're a corporate and do see the value of virtual cards or a corporate and don't, we're a bank, do and don't, or other, let's say a FinTech, do or don't, just so we can get a, a, a list of those to see um, what's the makeup here um, of the audience, uh, who's seen what. So we'll give everybody an opportunity. Nobody needs to type the word V card in the chat box anymore. We're, we're probably uh, passing 200. Um, so we're, we will not bank these for the next V card thing. They all expire <laughs> and uh, we'll share the information. So Brian, as soon as that's up, we're going to, uh, respond and Anthony, I'll have you, uh, give any quick comments and we'll, we'll just, we'll just move, um, we'll move on to Mark with the next slide as soon as, uh, after you make your comments. Yeah. Yeah. So just reading through, I'm seeing 45% of respondents have a virtual card program in place, which is wonderful. And we re really see this uh, uh, from, from our data as really such a fast growing uh, payment mechanism, especially in the commercial card space. Virtual The virtual card expected growth rates are just outpacing uh, virtual cards and, and other T&E programs. And for lots of good reasons that we've been discussing on this call. And it's also encouraging to see that um, corporates are seeing the value of, of, of virtual cards. Um, I'd love to dig in. At, I know we don't have time, but you know, I'm seeing 30% uh, of banks that do not, that do see the value. Okay, do see the value. So consistent with what we've seen in the surveys and all fantastic. Yeah, 15 to one in favor of uh, banks seeing the value and three to one. For corporate, so great information. We're gonna, Quick we're gonna. Con I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, Mark, if you would, uh, if you'd continue. Uh, so I think, um, you know, for sake of time too, uh, I think over, you know, it says over half offer accelerated payment terms for virtual card. I think this is a new trend, right? Used to be if a if a vendor was going to accept terms or accept an early pay, for instance, or some other payment term. They didn't want to accept card because obviously there's a transaction fee. So they're already they're already in that place. But again, I think we're seeing this shift because of the value of the card, the the time 
uh, the time cost for money is just there. And then the, the bottom one there, three-fifths corporate think suppliers see the value in virtual cards. Again, totally agree with that. It doesn't surprise me when I see those numbers continue to go up. Uh, and, and if you think about it from the receivable side, I mean, this is a much cleaner process for them as well, just to be able to process that card. And, and as Anthony said, you know, we, we, we use single, what's called a single swipe, single use card. So it's very secure, very locked down. It's specific for the amount of the payment. Um, it can only be swiped one time. It has to be swiped for the exact amount. And uh, so it's very hard for a fraudster to get that and do anything with it. So it just makes the process much more efficient, less chance for security breaks, and uh, the vendors are much more happy with it. Thanks, and Anthony. Yeah, th thanks, Craig. So, you know, I think this all ties back to a lot of things that we're talking about is that the end-to-end -end value prop is just so critical with cost and rebates uh, topping the list. So, you know, as I said prior, you know, traditionally, a lot of solutions have been historically either AP focused or AR focused. And I think with a lot of the emerging solutions that are that are coming out and, and ones that you certainly we're focusing on uh, are really looking at that end-to-end -end view to provide that. Uh, that that cost benefit back to the to the organizations and both the buyers and the suppliers. Yeah. So as we move uh, we move past the uh, value as a driver and the payments decision, there's also some challenges um, that come up. And this there's a rich set of the challenges that are covered in the survey report. So we'll pop those up in the uh, the news section. But Anthony, if you'll cover the perceived challenges, then we'll move on to regulatory pains after that. Yeah, sure. So from a from a perceived challenge with virtual cards, I mean, the standout is certainly vendor adoption. Um, and it's something I think the industry is really working wholeheartedly to address. But I also want to draw your attention to uh, the effort required for supplier enablement. That's the third, the third bar from your left. Um, there's significant work to be done there, and it's certainly an investment and a, st a strategic focus uh, for my organization, for MasterCard, and looking at how can we opt help organizations optimize their enablement efforts, because that number three really feeds and helps alleviate the challenge on the adoption level. So if you optimize enablement, you give greater chances for, for greater acceptance, which is just such a such a huge focus for us. So the, the, this doesn't surprise me either. The regulation pains, as, as I shared with you earlier, you know, the, the, uh, the amount of security protocols we go to, particularly if you're using ACH, right? Um, KYC procedures, uh, know your customer probably is, is, is the biggest one. If, you, if you're going to be in the business of moving money and transferring money from bank to bank via ACH, you really have to have your KYC processes in place. And along with that, just the additional security protocols, as I shared, are so important to ensuring if you're going to store vendor data or vendor banking information, that you've gone through that process to make sure that that vendor is real, to make sure that the bank account that they're using is real and belongs to them, that they're, you know, all of the things that go into the KYC process. Uh, and, and we see this all the time that that organizations, particularly smaller ones, try to do this, but they circumvent it or they don't do it completely. And now they're owning the responsibility of the banking information. It's just a big, it's a big, big headache. And um, there's no way around it. You've got to do your KYC. If you're going to continue to manage and disperse money to your vendors internally, then, then that's on you. Again, I, I have a different perspective, right? I come from a world where this is our business. So I, I certainly wouldn't want to do it if I was the AP staff or the AP department trying to handle this. The other one's OFAC sanctions. You know, this, this really has to do with uh, more international FBAR, same thing. The last one, PCI, you know, um, um, information. That I think all of those, the payment card, that's the payment card information, right? Storing that, managing that are all in there. But the KYC process is probably the biggest one. Anthony, your thoughts on that too? Yeah, couldn't agree more. And I, I, even I'd say over the past five to 10 years, there's certainly been an evolution in 
the importance the uh, and the requirements around this space, which I think as an industry, we're all adapting to. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, that brings us to the last uh, the last content slide before we have uh, some uh, deliverables and uh, content for you to take away. Uh, I'll begin, and then Anthony, if you'll take the middle, Mark, if you'd finish up the uh, the different pillars here. First is recognize that there are a number of pains in payments, and those pains uh, may be errors, uh, friction, cost. Um, that's a uh, that's a broader concept. The other two, I'll just summarize the opportunities for payments internally and externally could be summarized with this end-to-end -end view. Opportunities for payments internally to provide control, efficiency, visibility, also have the same uh, needs for your counterparts who are receiving those payments. Or if you're a receiver, uh, both parties want to see that. So there's an opportunity to have efficient payment processes that provide visibility that helps for things like forecasting, cash flow uh, that don't that aren't excessively costly, but also provide protection because that's one of the key areas we have to protect payments. So there's a number of opportunities across these different dimensions within your organization and between your organization and the paying or the payor or the payee. And I think the value is just really completely linked to the recognition of the pain points. Because one, understanding the pain points gives you a North Star where you can go uh, to alleviate those pain points. And you know, as we've discussed throughout this panel, there, there's so many wonderful technologies that are available today, more so than ever before, that leverage things like cloud computing, like artificial intelligence, um, automation services that can really help bring the value to your organization and have that kind of operational leverage of not having to deploy something heavy in order to get those gains. The key there though is, is, is education and making sure uh, you have the right folks that can advise you and trusted advisors that can advise you on what are those, what are the most optimal solutions and simple solutions to meet your needs? Because simplicity is really key. You don't want to over-engineer. And I think that was a great point raised by Mark earlier. Uh, Craig, there was one question uh, in the chat in the Q and A. There it says, if a card is single use, how are supplier vendor refunds handled? Uh, well, usually through a credit, right? Instead of instead of changing the amount being paid on the card, you're going to just the vendor is typically going to put a credit uh, in invoice or credit back onto the customer's account and deal with it that way. It's kind of like a check, right? If they cash the check. They've got to either send the send the money back or give you a credit against your next bill. So that's that's normally what happens in that process. Yeah, thanks, Mark. I know there's a number of other questions in the in the regular chat box too that we, we just have didn't have time to get to. Mark, if you could bring us home on protection. Um, well, so fraud is rampant, as we've talked about. I think you know understanding the various payment methods that you can use, and then uh, you, you know one of the areas that we see. Uh, lacking is is staff training, right? That for your staff to really understand when it comes to fraud, what am I looking for? Am I for phishing emails, for vendor fake vendor emails, right? Vendors that want to change bank accounts, all of those things. There's a lot of training that goes into that, and keeping your staff up to date on the different ways that fraudsters are coming at you, I think, are very important. And then again, we've talked about this, assess your payment process. What does it look like today? What does that workflow look like? Where are the pain points? How do I, how do I augment what I'm doing and reduce the amount of manual processes in there? Excellent. Uh, thank you, uh, Anthony and Mark and everybody who's listened in. And I'll turn it back over to Brian for a couple of key announcements here. Thank you for uh, joining us. Indeed, thank you everyone for joining us today. The CTP credits, Today's webinar slides and a recording of today's webinar will be sent to you within five business days. And for more in-depth analysis on these two surveys, be sure to download the survey reports by clicking the links in the chat box. Thank you, and we hope you have a good rest of the day.